In this lecture, we look at some general methodology to analyze heat transfer problems. In earlier video, we discussed the method of uh, Paulia for solving engineering and mathematical problems. So we'll briefly recollect what those points are. So there are four steps in Paulia's method, understanding the problem, devising the plan, carrying it out and looking back. Understanding involves restating it. Devising a plan is to try and find connection between knowns and un unknowns, equations and so on. Carrying out is actually solving analytically or numerically and looking back is to validate it. Uh, what we are going to discuss in this particular video is about this step. So how do we what do we mean by carrying out or devising a plan for heat transfer problems? So what is the plan for heat transfer? How do we go about uh, getting more systematic about solving heat transfer problems? So the first thing after you have drawn the diagram. So the drawing the diagram is part of the previous step where it's part of the understanding step, drawing a schematic diagram. After that, for heat transfer purposes, the first thing that we do is to draw the control volume. So if this is the system that we are considering, so there is a solid object and that is placed on another uh, wall kind of object or a floor. And then we define the control volume. So control volume is usually de denoted by a closed dot dashed line and the dashed line surface is the control surface. So this is a 2D representation of what is actually a 3D object. So the first thing that you do is to represent the control volume. Then you decide on the time basis. So are you going to consider a finite time interval and carry out the energy balance? Or are you going to use time instance. So in the case of time instant, we need to use rate of change. In the case of time interval, we have to use absolute change in quantities. There is no time involved there. Right. The next is the most important step to identify on the surface, what are the various modes of heat transfer? Okay. So what are the various uh, um, uh, things that are reaching the surface and what is going out. So there is a convection, there's radiation, there is some uh, radiation going out, radiation coming in. And inside the volume, are there any chemical reactions that are taking place, nuclear reactions that are taking place, uh, some electrical wire is going on, which is heating and so on. So there is a bulk heating here and there is a surface phenomena on the surface. So Identifying these phenomena is very crucial to identifying the connection between various things. So in this, the plan, we are supposed to identify connections. So before we do that, these are the typical things that we have to look for. And in that things, we have seen what are the things that are given. Okay, we broadly know what is given, but detail we need to see whether things, everything required for convection is there, radiation is there, uh, uh, and irradiation is there and so on. So once we identify the phenomena, so these are all phenomena related to uh, heat transfer. After that, we look for different types of equations. So depending on what is the unknown, we either write a comp complete integral balance that is called the lumped parameter on the entire volume, or you can write a small shell balance and write a 1D equation or a complete differential equation for the uh, in two dimension or three dimension as the problem might demand. Um, once we have written this, we might have the entire generic set of equations. Then we can go and state the assumptions. So for a given condition, we have to try and simplify uh, different uh, uh, conditions so that we can solve it easily. So uh, state the assumptions. And once you've stated the assumptions, 
you will also be able to list out the properties that are needed. So if you say there is conduction here, then so what is the conductivity, what is the emissivity, what is the absorptivity, and there is a convection, there'll be some uh, tran heat transfer coefficient and so on. So uh, list down all those things and solve the problem as much as possible. If it is possible to solve it analytically, go ahead and do it and solve it completely in terms of symbolic variables. Don't substitute the values uh, to begin with. That's a very uh, bad practice. You will not catch errors if you do like that. So uh, once you have defined these notations, continue to use this variable notations till the last uh, step. Only in the last step, you substitute values. Don't substitute from the beginning because many things might just cancel out and you are prone to make more mistakes if you substitute at the beginning. Okay, now coming to this particular thing, identification of heat transfer modes. In an earlier video, we discussed about mechanisms of uh, conduction, convection, and radiation. And we try to relate them to the molecular motion of molecules. So one of the ways to identify this step, heat transfer modes in the surface, is to picture the uh, bodies involved. So, so it's, let's say there is a block kept in a room which is enclosed and the room has got surrounding air. So think of the molecules first. How are they moving? The random motion, is there a mean motion? In the case of uh, solids, they're all fixed at one location and there is this radiation coming from here and so on. So uh, try and relate this to the molecular picture as much as possible. That will help you identify the phenomena. As a thumb rule, in a solid block, you always have conduction and radiation inside the solid block. In the surrounding air, you'll have convection and conduction because it is a fluid. And the walls here uh, directly don't contribute to this by conduction or convection, but by radiation, it can heat the surface or cool the surface. Additionally, suppose if you have a fan on the top, which is moving the uh, fluid around. So the uh, surrounding air can also have fan and buoyancy driven uh, convection. So think, think of whether uh, the, it is, there is gravity present. So if gravity is not present, obviously there's not going to be any buoyancy driven convection. So if gravity is present, then the density differences because of temperature variation can lead to buoyancy driven convection. Okay. One of the other <clears throat> uh, things that we can do is to do what is known as back of the envelope calculations. So this will be helpful in doing simplifications. So what are these things? This is to estimate approximate heat transfer rates coming from different phenomena. So in this problem, we have several things that are happening. We don't know a priori which one of them is going to be important unless we have put some numbers in it. So that's what we are doing in this step. So what are those numbers? So let me just recall this uh, notation, Q double prime denotes rate of energy loss or gained per unit surface area. So rate of energy means joules per second per unit surface area. So that is watt per meter square in SI units. And we have this three modes of transfer, which we saw before. Q double prime X is K dt by dx. This is the Fourier's law. K is the thermal conductivity. And for convection, we have Newton's law of cooling. Q double prime is given by H times Ts minus T naught. And for radiation, in an engineering approximation, we have it as epsilon sigma times T power four body if it is higher temperature, minus T power 4 surroundings. So this is the uh, quick 
uh, equations that you should consider at the surface of the object. And then for this back of envelope calculations, if you want to estimate which is bigger and which is smaller, we need some values of k, h, and epsilon times sigma. So we have given that here as this, use this as a thumb rule calculations. For anything, you have to actually go and find out what material it is, but these are all approximate uh, variations. So for gases, these are all in SI units. For gases, conductivity is 0.1. So I'm going to ignore this because if I use everything consistently in SI units, I'm good to go. So for gases, thermal conductivity is 0.1 and metal maximum, it goes to 10 per 100. So gases, liquids, non-metals and metals. So metals, remember, thermal conductivity is high because of electron motion. Free electrons also carry heat. Whereas in non-metals, which is uh, electrically insulating, is also thermally inferior. So this is thermally superior that it conducts a lot. Thermally inferior because it is conducts a less because free electron motion is less. So this is a quick way to remember. And in liquids, it is uh, even less because there is uh, no uh, free electron motion and um, there is, a, uh, mostly it is by motion of molecules themselves. Okay, now this factor H is called as heat transfer coefficient or convective heat transfer coefficient. We we'll learn more about this when we uh, uh, study uh, convection. And uh, we gave a brief introduction to the meaning of H in the uh, lecture on convective heat transfer mechanism. So convective heat transfer mechanism, as we said, is because of the boundary layer uh, flow, which there is a temperature drop. Okay. So this, we don't need to worry about the details of that, but just for thumb rule purposes, we consider four cases, gases and liquids. So remember this is there, heat transfer is there, on, convective heat transfer is there only in fluids in contact with surfaces, okay? Not within fluids, uh, not without solids. So it's always fluids and solids has to be present. It's the interface of fluids and solids where you have the boundary layer. That's where we have this convective heat transfer. So uh, fluids, gases, and liquids, it is different. So in each of them, it is about 30 times more. Liquids is about 30 times more than gases. Similarly, uh, between free convection and forced convection, free convection or the buoyancy driven convection and forced convection, it is about 10 times more. So here it is 10 times more. Here it is 30 times more. So 10, 100, 300, and 3000. And for this last factor, which is epsilon times sigma, we don't have to keep this uh, separately, sigma separately. And although we know sigma by heart, uh, it's uh, as a thumb rule, it is useful to keep this product in mind. So for uh, polished surfaces, okay, where most of it is, a lot of it is reflected, a very less is absorbed, we have epsilon times sigma is 0.2 into 10 power minus eight. Okay, remember uh, sigma is 5.67 into 10 power minus eight multiplied by those factors, epsilon times sigma is 0.2 for polished and phi for matte. So matte finish, which is like a more gray finish that a lot of uh, light does not get reflected, but uh, it gets internally reflected and uh, goes inside the body and that's where it is quite high. So this goes from 0.2 up to 5 for mat. So let us estimate this heat transfer rate for this problem that we studied. So we have a hot cylinder kept in a room and the wall, it's other, otherwise it's completely insulated wall and there is a fan above. Okay. So how do we estimate this various quantities? So uh, let us give some typical values. Say, it, let's say it's given that the surface temperature of this is 400 Kelvin, okay? And the wall temperature 
here is 300 Kelvin. So let's say this is at uh, room temperature and this is like 100 degrees more than uh, room temperature. Okay, so this is 100 degrees more than room temperature. This is at room temperature. So the te difference between the temperature here is 100 degrees. Okay. And for simplicity, let us assume that the distance between the object and the wall is about one meter to so just make the calculations easy. So now, firstly, conduction in air. Okay. So, con so here we have conduction and convection, correct? So conduction in the air is K times dt by dx. So dt by dx, we approximate it as K times delta t by L, right? So this entire gradient here, we replace it by delta t by L. So delta t is 100, L is uh, 1, and thermal conductivity for gases is 0.1. So this Q double prime X conduction, that is the rate at which heat is transferred from here to here by conduction in air is 10 units in SI, 10 watt per meter square. Let's look at conduction, convection. So convective heat transfer coefficient for air in force convection, okay, or free convection. So if it is free convection, it is 10, force convection, it is 100 for gases. So if, let's, if you plug it in here and you have a temperature difference of 100, so the Q double prime convection goes from 1000 to 10,000. Then coming to the radiation part, and uh, let's say if this is a surface which is shiny, uh, we could substitute that and then calculate Ts minus Tw for 100 degrees difference. Now, again, there's another approximation we can make here. Ts power 4 minus uh, Tw power 4, you can write it as T square minus T square plus T square plus minus, uh, A square plus B square minus A square minus B square. And again, take A square minus B square and split it. And in the limit, if Tw is much small compared to Ts, that is the difference of 100, you can uh, approximate all those cube terms as one single, there'll be T square term times a T, T term, you become T cube term times this. So this is also another good engineering uh, approximation that uh, is for thumb rule calculations. All right, so now when we substitute this, we get this one to be 1000. So conduction, convection, and radiation. So we see that the most, the dominant is the force convection, which is 10,000. Whereas con free convection and radiation are all of similar magnitude. Whereas conduction in air is way less. It's about 100 times less. So using this kind of simplifications and these estimates, we can quickly get to understand the uh, modes of heat transfer, which are important. Thank you.